Welcome, everyone, virtually, to the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence at Case Western Reserve University. We're delighted that you could join us for today's event, and I will be co-hosting it with our Associate Director, Beth Trecasa. Our wonderful and distinguished guest today uh, will be my dear friend, David Livingston Smith, and I will tell you more about him in a moment. Uh, but first, I also wanted to thank our sponsors and our supporters, and especially thanks to the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards for making this event part of their Cleveland Book Week. Now, let me tell you a bit about our distinguished speaker. David Livingston Smith is a professor of philosophy at the University of New England in Biddeford, Maine. He has written or edited nine books, including Less Than Human, Why We Demean, Enslave, and Exterminate Others, which won the 2012 Annisfield Wolf Book Award for nonfiction. His work has been translated into seven languages. David is an interdisciplinary scholar whose publications are cited not only by philosophers like me, but also by historians, legal scholars, psychologists, anthropologists, and many more. He has been featured in several primetime television documentaries, is often interviewed and cited in the national and international media, and was a guest at the 2012 G20 Economic Summit, where he spoke about dehumanization and mass violence. He has another book coming out next year from Harvard University Press, which we are also eagerly awaiting, which will be called Making Monsters, the Uncanny Power of Dehumanization. And with that, I would like to turn us over to our wonderful guest. Thank you for being here with us, David. Thank you so much, Shannon. And uh, thanks to the Inamori Center and the Annisfield Wolf Awards for, for making this possible and for promoting it. I'm here because I think this is a very important topic, an immensely significant topic to discuss. Uh, you know, this series is concerned with justice. And uh, famously, Martin Luther King said in 1956 that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Well, I'm not as sanguine as Martin Luther King was, because I think it only bends towards justice if we work very hard to bend it in that way. And once we bend it in that way, we cannot relax our grip because there are always forces promoting injustice in our world. Now to bend the moral, the arc of the moral universe towards justice, we need to understand how injustice works. We need to be able to pop the hood and look inside at the mechanisms that promote injustice. And this is precisely what I've attempted to do in my most recent book, On Inhumanity, Dehumanization, and How to Resist It. I wrote this book not for fellow academics primarily, although it will be of use to them, but for a very, very broad readership. And I wrote it for a very broad readership because I think the topic that I discussed, the phenomenon of dehumanization, is terribly important for all of us to understand. And as history proceeds, as political events unfold in this country, and as the world swings more and more towards authoritarian regimes, it is more important than ever to understand dehumanization. Dehumanization is not the only process that promotes injustice, but it is a very, very important one. So let me tell you a little bit about why I chose to write this book, and then we will figuratively roll up our sleeves and get into some of the content. About 15 years ago, I was writing a book on war, and I was impressed by the amount of dehumanizing wartime propaganda, the tendency of people to represent their enemies in war as subhuman creatures, as dangerous predators, or as game that are 
fun to, to, to kill. And I thought to myself, this is very, very interesting. I need to look into this more deeply. And what I found was that almost all of the literature on this phenomenon was in social psychology. And I, a philosopher, was dissatisfied with the way that social psychologists dealt with the phenomenon of dehumanization. So the book that Shannon alluded to that won the 2012 um, Annisfield Wolf Award for nonfiction was my attempt to do better. And it was in fact the first single authored book in the English language and perhaps in any language dealing with this phenomenon. Over the years, my views have changed somewhat. They've become more sophisticated. I've responded to criticisms, both made by others and made by myself. And uh, I've modified my approach to this phenomenon of dehumanization accordingly. And the new book, which you can actually see behind me here, uh, is a presentation of my revised position. It might seem strange to you that I say that dehumanization has been given little attention outside of social psychology. Because it, you, you hear it all the time. The word now, to my horror, is used almost every night on, on cable news, on one channel or another. If you Google dehumanization, you find literally millions of hits. So isn't it getting a lot of attention? Well, the word is being used a lot, but there's been little work outside of social psychology figuring out what exactly this word names and how the processes that it refers to actually work. So this is what I've attempted to do. Now, let me, let me start digging into the content with two quotations. Let me, I'll open my, my book here. Uh, this is from the great African-American sociologist and thinker, W.E.B. Du Bois. He's writing in 1899. And he says, the widening of the idea of common humanity is of slow growth and today but dimly realized. We grant full citizenship in the world commonwealth to the Anglo-Saxon, whatever that may mean, the Teuton and Latin, and then with just a shade of reluctance, we extend it to the Celt and the Slav. We half deny it to the yellow races of Asia, admit the brown Indians to an anteroom only on the strength of an undeniable past, but with the Negroes of Africa, we come to a full stop. And in its heart, the civilized world denies that these come within the pale of 19th century humanity. Now, Du Bois is writing at the dawn of the 20th century or just before the dawn of the 20th century. And you might think this is ancient history. And indeed, I could give you examples of people stating that other groups of people do not belong to the us, to the human race, that go back many centuries indeed. But that doesn't mean it is ancient history because dehumanization is going on now in subtle forms and in blatant forms. And it is promoted. This is so important. It's so important now for us. I mean, I beg you, I literally beg you to attend to this. It's promoted by political propaganda and ideology. So let me give you another more recent example. This is from, oh, maybe 20 years ago, a little bit less. I could give you more recent examples. And my book contains a lot of them. And this is from uh, the testimony of a man who describes his dehumanization of others. This is the testimony of a man who participated in the Rwanda genocide of 1994. 
in which the, uh, the Hutu bludgeoned and hacked Tutsi people to death, hunted them down like beasts with an exterminationist agenda. And over the space of three months, killed practically a million people. He said in an interview, this man, they, he's referring to his fellow genocidaires, they did not know the Tutsi were human beings. Because if they had thought about that, they wouldn't have killed them. Let me include myself as someone who accepted it. I wouldn't have accepted that they are human beings. I can't explain it. The only answer I can give is that it was like being in a fog, something like a darkness. So those who are skeptical that dehumanization, as I will describe it in a moment, is a thing, that it's real, I would urge them to take the words of this man and others very, very seriously. This man who had nothing to gain described an altered state of consciousness that he was in that enabled him to think of others who looked in all important respects just like him, paradigmatic human beings, as less than human creatures. It's puzzling, but it's real. So let's start out by being clear about what I mean by dehumanization. In my view, dehumanization is the attitude of thinking of others as subhuman creatures. So it's very important to be clear because as I mentioned before, people use this term in all sorts of different ways. And that's not just in the vernacular, where it's used very loosely, but among scholars as well. Scholars use the term in all sorts of different ways. So it's very, very easy for people to talk past one another. Some people think of dehumanization as just bad treatment, degrading, cruel treatment. But in my view, we don't need dehumanization for that. Some people think of it as using animalistic slurs like rat or pig. In my view, that is merely verbal. Some people think that dehumanizing others is treating them as objects. In my view, that is not the case. That is a separate phenomenon next door. In my view, and this is most compatible with the paradigmatic examples, and what I take as paradigmatic examples are things like attitudes of colonial colonists towards those whom they colonize, such as Native Americans, uh, the Holocaust, and the brutal oppression of African Americans in this country. The account of dehumanization that I think is most consistent with all of those examples is what I just explained to you. Dehumanization is thinking of others as subhuman creatures. And right away, I'm just gonna, it seems to me like there's some interference with emails coming in and so on. I'm not gonna mess with this. Um, that raises puzzles right away. And you may be forgiven for thinking that that just couldn't be the case. It couldn't be that people actually look at other people and think of them as subhuman creatures, and not only subhuman creatures, but in particular, the form of dehumanization I want to describe today, the form of dehumanization, which typically goes with racial oppression and with genocide and with, with really the very worst things that human beings do to one another. They think of them as dangerous subhuman creatures. So let's play a little game. It's not a pleasant game, perhaps, but we'll play a little game to get the point across. Suppose you are a committed Nazi. It could be a 1942 Nazi, 
or if you prefer, one of the many neo-Nazis which are active in the world and in this country today. And you learn that I am a Jew. Or of course, if you're a real, a real Nazi, perhaps I'm being uh, incarcerated in a slave labor camp to be worked to death or exterminated. Now, if you're a committed Nazi, you see me in virtue of my race. And for Nazis, being a Jew is a racial categorization. It's not a religious categorization. As less than human, as an untermensch, as a subhuman. So you look at me, you look into my eyes, and you don't see anything different than, in, you know, anything significantly different than you would see if you looked into the eyes of a, a fellow SS officer, or Josef Goebbels, or Adolf Hitler. You see a bipedal being that wears clothes, that speaks your language, that takes the streetcar to work, that does all the things that human beings do and looks like a human being. And yet, you think of me as less than human. Well, to make a long story short, I don't want to go into all the psychological details here. I draw on psychological research to explain how this is possible. And basically, psychologists since the light, late 1980s have found, and there's an immense amount of research supporting this, that we naturally think that the way a being appears is not what makes them the kind of being they are. That is, a being can look like one kind of thing, but really, on the inside, where it matters, be something else entirely. So, if you think that's strange, just think of watching a horror film, say, about vampires. Well, you have no difficulty at all thinking of the vampire as looking like a human being, as outwardly human, but as inwardly something else. So this distinction between appearance and what the psychologists call essence, I think, is what makes it possible for people to engage in that sort of mental gymnastics. So you Nazis, you think, oh yes, he looks perfectly human, but on the inside, he's not human at all. He's something else. He's something that needs killing. He's something like a rat, filthy, a vector of infection, a danger. So, like I said, I, th I think that's how it works. I think that when we dehumanize others, part of what goes on is that our psychology permits us to think of them as counterfeit human beings, just as you might have a $10 bill that, well, a piece of money that you think is a $10 bill because it looks like a $10 bill, but it isn't really a $10 bill, even though it's indistinguishable outwardly. So the dehumanizer thinks of the dehumanized in, in this sort of way. But there's another element that comes in. Actually, there are several other elements. There's another element of the psychology. And that element of the psychology is that when we dehumanize people, we think of them as not merely other, not merely different, not merely non-human, but subhuman, less than human. How does that work? Well, it should be apparent right away that if we think of some beings as less than human, we're operating with the conception of a hierarchy, that there are beings in the world that are higher than others and beings that are lower than others. Now, there is, in fact, 
a literature on this, but it's not a psychological literature. And that is, it's actually a very small literature, surprisingly. I continually try to get psychologists interested in this because I think it is a genuine psychological disposition. The literature to which I refer is literature on the history of ideas. And indeed, there is precisely one authoritative book on this hierarchical notion of how the world is arranged. It was published in the 1930s by a philosopher named Lovejoy. Arthur O. Lovejoy. And Lovejoy argued that in antiquity, philosophers cobbled together bits from Aristotle and bits from Plato and synthesized them into a model that he called the great chain of being. And this was the idea that the universe was ordered from most perfect at the top to less perfect below. And every kind of being had a rank in this order. So God was at the top, being the supremely perfect being by definition. Below that were arrayed the archangels, then the angels, and then we placed ourselves just below the angels. And all of the non-human animals were in serried ranks, situated below us, right down to inanimate matter. Now, if you look at the relevant literature from the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, you can actually see diagrams of this. Um, they, people took it very seriously. According to Lovejoy, this uniquely European way of looking at things persisted for centuries and then died out, say in the late 18th, early 19th century. There's only one problem with this view. It's not entirely true. <laughs> Lovejoy's book is a great work of scholarship, but in fact, we find hierarchical conceptions of the cosmos in many places in the world, and in many places where it cannot be attributed to European influence. And indeed, it lives on in us now. We do things to those creatures that we consider to be less than us, that we would have great difficulty doing to our own kind. Swat a mosquito, kill a cockroach, pluck a weed. These are acts of killing. And what if I said, how could you do that to that weed? Well, what would you say? It's only a weed. It's beneath us. I think there are important what reasons why we think about the world in this sort of way, and it is extraordinarily difficult to shake, even though Darwin should have put it in its grave 150 years ago. I won't go into that here. I do go into it in the book. Suffice it to say that this gives us the notion of subhumanity. So if we combine what I said about essentialistic thinking the dichotomy between what a thing is on the inside and how it appears on the outside, we get something like this. Dehumanization occurs when we conceive of others as appearing to be human beings, but as having the essence of something lower on this hierarchy, right? having the essence of a lesser creature. Now, this is in fact the, the model I promoted in my 2011 book, Less Than Human. Um, there are a couple of other elements that go into the, the mix from that period of my thinking, which I have retained. I've retained all of this. I've just added some very important wrinkles. And one of those elements is, um, what dehumanization is for, All right? So why are human beings so prone to look at other groups of people, the not us, as less than human? Well, I'll tell you one thing it isn't. It isn't just they're an out group. 
that that's not an explanation at all, right? That's just a redescription. I think there's compelling evidence that we dehumanize people to overcome obstacles in ourself to doing them tremendous harm. And here's why that's necessary. We human beings are hypersocial primates. We're extraordinarily social. We live in large groups, large cooperative groups. None of us would do well on our own plopped in the middle of a rainforest, say. Not good prospects. Our very existence depends on sociality. That's how we evolved. That's our nature. And any highly social animal has to have very powerful inhibitions against doing lethal harm to fellow community members for obvious reasons, right? You can't, if you're ripping each other's throats out, you can't maintain a social way of life. So that extends to us. And unlike many creatures that are social creatures, our inhibitions against violence are not strictly limited to the local breeding group, but it extends to others outside. But we're also really clever, you know. We've got these great big brains and we can think instrumentally and we can think, oh, wouldn't it be advantageous for us if we went over the hill to the folks next door and wiped them out to steal their resources, to enslave them, to oppress them, to exploit them. So left just there, you could see people between a rock and a hard place. They think of it as advantageous to do violence to others, but there's something in them that makes it really difficult. Well, another aspect of our species, our capacity for culture, has led us to discover cultural means of undermining those inhibitions, of getting ourselves to do things which we would not otherwise be capable of doing very easily. In general, there are always a small number of people who don't, who don't care, who don't have those inhibitions. Dehumanization is one of them. And by dehumanization here, I mean dehumanizing propaganda. We'll get, we'll get to that very specifically in a second. If people in positions of authority, if our political leaders, if our religious leaders can induce us using their skills to think of some other group of people as less than human and as dangerously less than human, as predators, as monsters, as demonic, then it empowers us to more readily do terrible things to them. And because of our psychology, because our, of our tendency to essentialize and think hierarchically, we have vulnerabilities. We have psychological vulnerabilities to that sort of propaganda when it is skillfully produced. And before I'm done, I, I hope to say a few words about the skillful production of this sort of propaganda. So what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong with that picture? That was the picture I presented in 2011. I said, I've revised it. What's wrong? Well, one thing that's wrong is that I didn't emphasize race sufficiently for reasons which I really don't have time to go into in detail here, but which I explain pretty thoroughly in several chapters of the new book. It's almost always the case that a group of people is racialized before they're dehumanized. That's why I call dehumanization racism on steroids. And indeed, all of the paradigmatic examples that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk involved racialization. Colonialism, the genocide of Native Americans, the oppression of Black Americans, and the Holocaust. They all, in all cases, 
the dehumanized population was racialized, was thought of as a separate race. The reason for that is that racialization itself, thinking of others as belonging to a not me race, is a way of demoting them and a way of making cruel and degrading acts acceptable. Because to racialize a group of people is to think of them as an inferior kind of human being, a kind of human being whose lives do not matter. Dehumanization takes that a step further. They're not inferior human beings. They're not human beings at all. Okay. So I've come to emphasize that much more now than I did in 2011, although it was there in 2011. But here are a couple of things that I was blind to. And actually, we're gonna, I'm going to start by explaining a sh two shortcomings of the picture that I've just given you. One of them, which has gotten some currency in the literature, the philosophical literature has started to um, engage with dehumanization in the last 10 years, is that when people dehumanize others, they don't just conceive of them or describe them, talk about them as subhuman animals, as lice, as vermin, or as predators. They also, the way it's usually put in the literature, implicitly treat them as human beings by trying to humiliate them, by referring to them, say, as criminals, a category which it is said only applies to human beings, and so on. And that leads to a kind of skepticism. People don't really think of other racialized groups as subhuman. They just talk like they do in order to degrade them. Now, I take this line of criticism even further. It's often quite explicit that dehumanizers describe those whom they dehumanize as human. And often in the space of a single sentence, they will refer to them as human and subhuman. Let me give you an example. This is um, from my book. And this is about the dehumanization of Romani people you know, often referred to as gypsies. Although beliefs about the Romani coalesced into an ideology five centuries ago, they persist in the collective consciousness of non-Romani people, especially in Europe, to this day. Gypsies still suffer discrimination, are still regarded as filthy, disease-ridden subhumans, and are commonly assumed to be thieves and criminals in Europe. And they are still targeted with lethal violence. Violence like that which erupted in the village of Hadereni, Romania, in 1993, when a Roma man stabbed one of the residents to death in an altercation. The killer and three Confederates fled to their house and locked themselves inside, fearing reprisals. Before long, townspeople, including the local policeman, surrounded the house, doused it with gasoline, and set it ablaze. Two of the men were burned to death, and the other two were clubbed to death by the crowd while trying to flee. The crowd of men, women, and children could hear the dying screams of the burning men. Twelve more Roma homes in Hadereni were burned to the ground that day when by a mob of around 500 Romanians and Hungarians. Now here's the bit that illustrates the point. A reporter for the British newspaper, The Independent, interviewed two of the participants in the pogrom who pro profess that they were proud of their actions. Here's one of them, a woman named Maria. On reflection, she said, it, it would have been better if we had burned more of the people, not just the houses. Notice their people in this sentence. She goes on and says, 
we did not commit murder, how could you call killing gypsies murder? Gypsies are not really people. So first they're people, then they're not people. You see, they're always killing each other. They are criminals. Well, to be a criminal, you have to be a person. But then she says, subhuman, verbin, vermin. So there, they're not human anymore. And that's absolutely typical, that alternation. The other problem, which as far as I know, I'm the only person who has raised this objection to my own theory, which is kind of fun. I call the problem of monstrosity. The previous one I call the problem of humanity. And that is when people are dehumanized, at least in the most toxic forms of dehumanization, they're not merely regarded as less than human animals. They're often described as monsters and demonic beings. And there's no place for monsters and demonic beings on the great chain of being, right? They're off the map. So we need, we need a theory of dehumanization that addresses this alternation between characterizing these others as human and subhuman. And that explains the description of them as monsters. Well, I guess I should, let me, let me illustrate that before going on. So one of the things I study quite intensely is uh, lynching in the United States from the late 19th century into well into 20th century, and in particular, spectacle lynching. These were lynchings that were widely advertised. They attracted thousands of onlookers, up to like 10, 15,000 onlookers. And they were nothing like lynchings that you see in the movies. All the lynchings you see in the movies and on TV are cleaned up, sanitized versions, even the ones involving small numbers of people. Spectacle lynchings, whole families watched as the victim, who was usually a black man, was tortured brutally, dismembered while alive, had skin stripped from his body, and then after hours of this, burnt to death at events which were colloquially described as barbecues. If you look at the press coverage of these events, particularly the Southern press, but not exclusively the Southern press, the victims of lynchings were described as fiends, monsters, monsters in human form, and so on. And that's not just there, right? So if we go back and look at medieval anti-Semitism, in my next book, I have a long discussion of this. It was, it, was, it was very common, say from the 12th century onward, for European Christians to characterize Jews as literally demonic beings. So how do we deal with this? Well, here's how I think we deal with it. I'm going to put it very succinctly. Um, because I want to, to have some time for questions and answers and, or as I prefer to call it conversation. I don't like this act questions and answers. It's so really authoritarian. I can share views, but very often I don't have the answers. Um, basically, it's this. Look, I said we were hypersocial animals. And one of the implications of that fact about us, which is not at all controversial, is that we very readily respond to others as human beings. Particularly the side of the human face and even more particularly the side of human eyes when we're confronted with this, we just can't help seeing human. It's built into us. It's a gut level response. In fact, it's, it's, we even see human when humans aren't there. I mean, there, there's a whole um, literature on a phenomenon called pareidolia. You can look at the front of a car and you see it as a face <laughs> or the front of a house, right? We see humanness a lot. That's how we're built. We have humanity detectors. And like I said, 
This is a gut level automatic response. However, what our eyes tell us or what our eyes seem to tell us is not coextensive with what we accept is true. Most of what we accept is true, we get from other people. Philosophers call this testimonial knowledge. So um, uh, last night, my spouse said it was drizzling outside. I didn't see the drizzle. I didn't hear the drizzle, but I accepted that as true on the basis of her testimony. But really most of what we accept, do you, did you see Columbus sailing the ocean blue in 1492? The year, by the way, when Jews were expelled from Spain? No. Do you, have you observed the very many scientific facts that you accept is true? No, you haven't. We, this is a very important phenomenon because it makes human culture possible. It makes cumulative knowledge handed down from generation to generation possible. And it, it makes a kind of epistemic division of labor possible. By epistemic, of course, I mean pertaining to knowledge. So we have experts, and these experts have special access to certain kinds of truths, and it behooves us to accept what they tell us about, say, climate change, or about the composition of your wedding ring. And we do this if we, if we have these, these people to turn to who are culturally situated as those who are supposed to know, even if what they tell us contradicts what our senses tell us. So my example, which I've repeated numerous times in these book talks, um, is the table in front of me here that my laptop is placed on, which looks like it's continuous, it's got no gaps, it's a purely, you know, solid, gapless object. But the physicists tell me that my senses deceive me there, that it's in fact mostly empty space. It's atoms floating in the void. And I take that on board. I can't help seeing it as without gaps. But at the same time, I take it on board that this is mostly empty space. And that's great. I mean, that adds to my grasp of reality tremendously. But there's a problem with this feature of human life. And the problem is that we will also take as authoritative statements that promote violence towards others, toxic beliefs about others, dehumanizing claims about others if we invest those people with authority. You know, if you're a white American in say 1850, that's when the most important scientific, and I put that in quotation marks, work about race was published. It was called Types of Mankind. It had the most distinguished scholars contributing to it from a variety of disciplines. And readers were assured this book went through nine editions in not many years. It was wildly popular. The, re the, the, the writers assured the readers that black people and white people were separate biological species. Now, suppose you are our reader. These are the most distinguished scholars in their fields. Well, you're going to be inclined to take it on board, just like you're inclined to take on board what the physicists tell you about a seemingly solid object. Or suppose you're in Germany in 1938 or better, 1942. We can bring the program of extermination into it if we do that. And there are the Nazi race experts, distinguished anthropologists, geneticists, pol politicians, 
scholars in the humanities tell you that these inferior races, in particular Jewish people, are subhuman. Well, of course you're going to be inclined to take it on board. And in fact, not taking it on board might be irrational. We invest authority in those who are in essentially political position of being experts. And nowadays, of course, we have these, but also celebrities and talk show hosts and politicians, not naming any names who dispense highly toxic representations of others, often, ex often implicitly and sometimes explicitly characterizing them as less than human. And the problem is, just as in the case of the physicists, it's easy to be influenced, particularly when they apply, apply the skills of political persuasion to take these views on board. Now, what happens when that happens? Well, I've already said it's part of our nature to see other members of our species as our kind, as, which is what basically it is to see someone as human. We can't help it. But at the same time, we take on board the views of experts all too often who characterize some group of others, particularly some racialized group of others, as subhuman. And what that leads to is two things. Well, it's one thing with two consequences. One consequence is we have a double image of the other as wholly human from the gut and wholly subhuman from the head. And this is what accounts, I believe, for this alternation that we saw, say, in Maria's testimony about the murder of Romani people. They're human, but they're not human. They're human rats, say. Right, so it's both. It also explains how dehumanization makes monsters. And for this, I need to add one more element. So, there's a literature that I draw on to explain this, which goes back over a hundred years. From anthropology, from psychology, from robotics. But I want to confine myself to just one contribution to that, which is from a philosopher, a philosopher named Noel Carroll. Noel Carroll wrote a wonderful book called Philosophy of Horror. Now, let's face it, philosophy books are usually so boring, they put you to sleep. They put me to sleep, and I'm a philosopher. But Carol's book is like a page turner. It's like a really good book. And one of the, it's, it's a book all about horror fiction. And one of the questions he asks in this book is what makes a monster? Like, what, what's the job description of a monster? And he says, to be a monster or being, has to satisfy two criteria. One is it has to be physically threatening. It's out to kill you, you know, to dismember you, to, to do real physical damage, to eat your brain, whatever. But that's not sufficient because, you know, there are lots of other physically dangerous things, right? Like rattlesnakes and, and, uh, and uh, reckless drivers and all kinds, all kinds of physically dangerous things. To be a monster, the monster has to also be what I call, and I depart from his language here, metaphysically threatening. Something that's metaphysically threatening is an impossible being that belongs to two mutually exclusive kinds simultaneously. So just think of a few examples. Think of as zombies, movie zombies. They're both alive and they're dead. And it's not like part of them is alive and part of them is dead. It's not like they have a dead arm, but the other arm is alive. They're totally dead and they're totally alive. Or a werewolf, 
which is totally a human and totally a wolf. This impossible fusion of incompatible kinds of things produces a very disturbing response. It's, I mean, the, it's the essence of horror. So now we can come back to our problem of monstrosity. Well, it's the fact, I believe, that when we dehumanize others, we just can't help th thinking of them as human while at the same time thinking them as subhuman, which accounts for turning them into monsters. Because, right, you might have noticed there's an element missing there, that's physical threat. Well, in the propaganda, remember, dehumanization comes from propagandists and ideologues that want us to do harm to people. The dehumanized other is virtually always described as dangerous, as essentially criminal, as evil, as out to get us. So that element is there too. Right? So this, in fact, this is an unintended consequence. When, when people dehumanize others, they turn them into monsters. And that makes them seem all the more terrifying and frightening. And make no mistake, When people dehumanize others, this is, there's a cruel paradox here that those who are dehumanized are typically the most vulnerable, the most marginalized members of a community. And they are seen as formidable, super predators, dangerous, a life and death threat. And therefore the dehumanizers see it as their, their moral mission to cage them, to exterminate them, to expel them. Now, before I finish and, and give you some time to speak with me, because this is election season, I want to say something about the sort of propaganda that most effectively delivers dehumanizing ideas about others. And it's very, very important because look, we're all vulnerable to this stuff. You may think that you, if you were, you know, a, a, a German in, the, in 1938, you, oh no, you wouldn't fall in with the Nazi party. Yeah, sure. You may think if you were a white Southerner in 1893, you wouldn't have gone to lynchings or gotten your hands dirty doing it. Yeah, sure. Doesn't work that way. We have to recognize our own vulnerability. It doesn't make us evil. It gives us a chance to protect ourselves from these toxic forces. So the analysis of, of propaganda, which has influenced me most, was carried out by a man named Roger Moneycarl who was a philosopher and a psychoanalyst and also had a PhD in anthropology. He was invited to Germany in uh, 1932, an intense political season, which ultimately led to Hitler gaining power in 1933. His friend, Arthur Yenkin, who was a diplomat, a, a British, a dipl an Australian man who was a diplomat for the United Kingdom, invited him and took him to see Hitler and Goebbels give their speeches. And Monikar wrote up his, his analysis of what went on in a paper published in 1941 called The Psychology of Propaganda. And basically, he said this. Hitler and Goebbels did the same thing over and over. So let's just talk about Hitler. The first move was to make the audience depressed. We have lost. We're the laughing stock of the world. We're suckers. Everyone's exploiting us. And he works them up into a state of depression. It's everything's hopeless, everything's bleak. The next move is the one I want to emphasize. The next move is he frightens them. Ah, but it's not really your, your fault at all. It's the Jews. It's the communists. 
it's the radical left. It's what would now be referred to as Antifa. They're the real enemy. And he scares them. And this is where dehumanizing imagery comes in, right? Because very often, not always, directly or indirectly, these others, these dangerous, predatory, filthy others, are represented as subhuman creatures that need to be, need to be killed. The final move is, I'm your savior. I'm the only one who can rescue you from these terrors. I, only I, can make Germany great again. Join me. And if you've been caught up in the first two movements of this sonata, you're a sucker for the third. So keep your wits about you in the, in the upcoming months and actually the upcoming years. Okay, I think this is perhaps a good place to stop. Gives a little over a half an hour if folks want me to address things. So. Yes, uh, I encourage, hi, this is Shannon again. If you can, <laughs> you can hear me, but perhaps not see me. Uh, first of all, David, thank you so much. Uh, that was incredibly enlightening and uh, whilst frightening, it was frightening in the right way. <laughs> and it forces us to think about the very things we must uh, encounter and uh, be honest about in ourselves. And I would like to invite everyone who is on here, including my students. Hello, students. I see some of my students amongst the participants. Uh, there is a button near the bottom of your screen that says Q&A, and you should be able to write questions in there. You may also, some of you may have access to a chat button. And if you chat all panelists, we can see that too. So if you have questions, that is how you get them to us with one or the other of those buttons, please. But I'm going to take uh, advantage of the um, <laughs> host role and ask a question first. It's really more to ask you to expand on uh, that important point that you closed with. You, you've reminded us that one of the keys is noticing when this is happening, uh, that mindfulness and awareness. And I'm wondering, to, to what should we be attuned beyond what you've said? You, you've mentioned uh, you know, some of the examples, uh, the dehumanizing language that calls people subhuman. Uh, are there other warning signs that we should notice, uh, yeah. maybe even in ourselves? Yeah. So, um, the subtitle of the book is Dehumanization and How to Resist It. So, uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit about how to resist it. Please do. Thank you. And, and resi to resist it, you need to preempt it. Because once you're caught up in it, well, as, as the, uh, the, the man who I quoted in the beginning said, I can't explain it. The only answer I can give is it's like being in a fog, something like a darkness. Once you're in that darkness... You're not in a position to see what's going on. So you got to catch it before you're in the darkness. Um, I think there are several dimensions to resisting dehumanization. And one pertains to self-knowledge. So I spend a lot of time explaining the psychological dynamics of dehumanization. De dehumanization I see as basically psychological, but you can't understand the psychology without understanding the world around, the political forces that impact on our minds. And, and we, we need really to understand our vulnerabilities. We need to understand our propensity for essentialistic and hierarchical thinking, uh, because that's the only way we can be vigilant with ourselves and not slip into these, these um, very compelling patterns of thought. Um, just, you know, a commitment not to is not sufficient, right? We, we really, you know, there's, there's no vaccine here. It's like COVID. There's no, no vaccine. And, but in this case, there's never going to be a vaccine. Right. Right. So we've got to stay on top of it. Um, I find that, that helpful, by the way, the sense of a permanent vulnerability uh, 
because it's so easy to get complacent. It's so easy to feel uh, that you don't have to have that turned on, that mindfulness all the time. Yeah, and, and, and you do. And, and, and you can s- detect it in yourself. Mm. If, you know, if someone pushes the right buttons, mm-hmm. I, I guarantee you, <laughs> you'll, get, you'll get your buttons pushed and you'll start sliding that way. Racism works exactly the same way, by the way. And sense. there are deep reasons for that, which I go into in the book. Okay. We've got some questions. You want me to just read them uh, so that everyone, just to make sure everyone can see them, David, and then... Yeah, but, but I, I'd really like to continue with this for a little bit first. Absolutely. It's such an important question. Uh, another is real education, historical education. And, and the reason for that is we... Um, now, here I'm speaking for Americans and primarily for white Americans. Um, if, we, if, if we're blind to the atrocities that we've committed, we are blind to our capacity to commit them. And the fact is, people go through the school system without an understanding of the real, real horrors. Um, I get my students, my, you know, under, my undergraduate liberal arts students who stumble into my course on race and racism, and they didn't have a clue. They had what I call the cartoon version of the history of race. Um, so that's really important. What's also important is looking outwards, understanding the forms of words, understanding the, prop, the processes of propaganda like I described to you, which are very skillfully exploit our our vulnerabilities and knowing that people can get us to dehumanize others without ever calling those others animals or monsters. All they have to do is nudge a little bit and then it's left to the audience to connect the dots, to use worms like swarm, swarming across the border. Or, you know, instead of talking about demons, talk about criminals. That, you know, demons don't really cut it in a secular society, but the idea of essential criminality does, but it works exactly the same way. And support those institutions which have some chance of protecting us. And no, this is so important to come back to propaganda, that unfortunately, the dehumanizers have the best stories. They have the most powerful stories. There's nothing that works like fear. Right. So in, in a way, it's, it's a somewhat unequal battle. Okay. Okay. So if you could, you know, mediate yeah, the I mean, questioners and me. I, I will, but, but thank you. And, and that last point that you ended on too, that, that it's an uneven battle. I, I think that we do forget, but the old saying about the news that fire always leads, hmm. you know, that, that, that idea that the, the scary things are more compelling in a disturbing way. That's understandable, right? That vulnerability yeah. is so easy to exploit. I find yeah. that really, really helpful. Okay, so um, we've got a question here uh, from my colleague, uh, Dr. Tony Jack, whom you know. Hey, Tony. <laughs> and he, he says, uh, thank you, David. Uh, you said, quote, we dehumanize to overcome obstacles to doing harm to others. Do you just mean overcome obstacles? Objectifying alone might achieve that, as Professor French and I have argued. <laughs> He's referencing the, the yeah. piece we co-wrote. Yeah. Do you perhaps mean something more, such as motivate, encourage, or psychologically justify? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. The reason I put it that way is that the motivation precedes the dehumanization, mm. right? So these, these people that are dehumanized are already situated as as bad, as destructive, as dangerous, and so on. But dehumanization also loops around and motivates violence, right? You know, dehumanized people are never cute puppies or sweet butterflies, right? They're 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 lice, they're ticks, they're they're rats, they're dangerous predators. So yes, thank you, Tony. 
Now, there are two questions that are very closely related, so I'm going to share both of them, and I think you can probably answer them together. Uh, one um, is uh, from a, a student, uh, Jeremy Rodriguez, who says, you ended your talk by addressing the three steps demagogues like Hitler uh, used to indoctrinate their supporters. Is there anything in your experience that can be effective at unindoctrinating those same individuals after the fact if preemption is not possible. And I want to note that then there's a second question uh, from Cynthia on the other side that says, uh, in the other box, that says, is there a way to engage in hopeful or more hopeful counter-programming that eases fear uh, as effectively? Mm -hmm. So those two seem very related. Well, there may be. And so one of my principles is I don't bullshit about things I, d I really don't think I have knowledge of. I'm sure there are, and there are steps we can take, um, but I would be deceiving you if, if I were to say that I understand exactly. I mean, there are people who recover from those things, right. and it's largely just by the way, this is what I can say, through the medium of social relations. It's, it's not through information, right? But you have to understand. If, if you've gotten into that mindset and you have been c complicit mm. in atrocity or have gotten your hands bloody, there are very powerful psychological forces making it difficult for you to, to accept that this was all a dream, right? This, is, this was all uh, an illusion. So again, there's a lot of- you're gonna be hit by what you've done. You're, you're crushing, gonna have to- Crushing guilt, what... yeah. Yeah, you you have to bear that. Yeah. Now, oh in my a God, way, those people I killed really were human, just like me. Yeah, and and this is actually it, this has a collective a dimension. I mean, American ex exceptionalism is is held up in very much that way. Mm, right. Oh uh, well, another question uh, from a student, Ryan. Uh, can you explain your view on the long term psychological effects? of dehumanizers. For example, soldiers in the military, when they use dehumanizing mechanisms in regard to their opponents that can rationalize their fight, not, not just in genocide, but in other more everyday operations. So not just the horrible act itself of dehumanizing others, but the long-term psychological effects of the repetition of dehumanization and what that can do to the dehumanizers as yeah. well. Yeah. So I, I think I want to make a distinction here mm -hmm. between just the act of dehumanization and the act of killing, mm. right? So the function of dehumanization is to permit acts like killing. Mm. Um, but once you have bloodied your hands, mm. it's a different ball game. Mm. So if it's just dehumanization, you have a, you, it's easier to recognize you had a false belief about mm. others than it is to present yourself with the trauma mm. attendant on spilling human blood. So re remember, in my story, we have these resistances to doing this, particularly when it's up close and personal, when we're presented with the cues, like the side of the human face. And we all know from the literature that it is psychologically incredibly difficult to look into another person's eyes and stick a blade in their guts. Mm -hmm. And people who have managed to do that are often haunted for a lifetime by that act. So, so that, you know, that's sort of psychological incentive to keep the dehumanization in place. But that act of killing, I think, is so powerful. Mm. And it's so underestimated. It's, it's, it's destructive capacities um, that it, it, it can destroy people's minds. It really can. So we're talking suicide. about moral injury here. and, and Moral that, injury, but I, I actually don't even like that term. No, yeah. moral, the term moral injury and moral injury theory is treated that way. It's, it's kind of refined. It's like you got these moral principles and you're defying them. I think it's much deeper than that. It's, it's mm. almost an, an, uh, an instinctive doing violence to something lodged so deep mm. in human nature that it, it's, 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 it's like, it's like stabbing yourself, you know, it's like, it's like, it's harming your own, it's doing violence to your own mind. 
I like, yeah, you're taking a piece of your own humanity each time. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's so, 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 and this is so underestimated. Mm. You know, I, I, combat veterans returning and people talk about them having PhD, like PS, PSDT, mm. as though it's like a bad case of the flu. Mm. It's not like that. It's, it's, no. it's just very serious stuff. And, and uh, mm. anyway, and bullshit about heroism does not fix anything. No, it does not. does not uh, cure PTSD. A uh, couple more thoughts here from, from some of the folks in the audience. Um, another student, Eric, I read a paper on the American horror film by Robin Wood last year, and in it, Wood discussed how the monster in films symbolically represent, represented repressed groups in society, including racial minorities, LGBTQ plus groups, women, etc. I remembered this paper when you mentioned a very similar definition of monster. And my question is, what actions would you advocate for the media, especially popular media, to take to address this subconscious demonization of minorities, the vulnerable groups you were talking about, in horror films specifically, as well as other media? Well, I, you know, I think sometimes that's the case and sometimes it isn't the case. I'm suspicious of broad c claims about what something represents in, 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 in works of, of art. Mm -hmm. and, and just by the way, you know, I, I used to be a Freud scholar. I'm not unsympathetic in principle to the idea of unconscious representations. Mm -hmm. But I think it sort of goes the other way around very often. It's the fact that, that trans people, that sexual minorities that racialized people and so on are monsterized, that makes horror a suitable vehicle mm. for, for, for representing them. Mm. So what, what we need to do is fix our social attitudes mm. and, and the movies will take care of themselves. <laughs> they will respond to the improvement in- Yeah, well, so we'll, we'll, we'll still be horrified, <laughs> but it won't have that socially toxic dimension because the socially toxic dimension has been dealt with itself. I, I like that feature, by the way. If we could get to that, if we could fast forward to that, that would be terrific. Yeah, me too. Um, another student, Sophie, uh, and we only have time for just a couple more real quick. Um, Sophie asks, from your description of a person who participates in violence from dehumanization as a, a fog, does legally punishing those who participate after the fact have any preventative value? Um. It may. It may. I don't know. That's an empirical question and requires an empirical answer. Yeah, it's, in, it's intriguing, isn't it? Because it's asking about whether we um, are punishing the wrong thing, in effect, and that the, mm. the instigators uh, may be yeah. the, the better objects of punishment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. And, and of necessity, that, of that actually happens, you know, mm. after the Second World War. Germany couldn't run, <laughs> you know, without former Nazis, often senior Nazis, being in, in positions of authority, right? It's just too big when we have a genocidal situation. So of necessity, distinctions have to be made right. in that kind of case. And then let's uh, close out with one. Uh, it looks like we have time for one last question, if we okay. may. Um, sorry, just scrolling down here. Uh, this, oh, Tony's back. This is <laughs> Dr. Jack again. Uh, thank you again. I do have another question. At one point, you seem to suggest that testimony, such as supposedly authoritative intellectual writings, those that claim, for example, that races are fundamentally different, might be major culprits in causing dehumanization and the subsequent injustice that follows. Mm -hmm. But are you sure that such works aren't more like rationalizations after the fact. Some work in psychology suggests emotions like disgust are, for evolutionary reasons, easily socially spread without requiring any intellectual dressing. So would you consider the possibility that the psychological root of dehumanizing is as much, or perhaps even more, a matter of emotional contagion a sort of nasty empathy rather than a matter of testimony. Um, so you catch it from oh, other people. Right. So, so yeah, well, you catch it from other people, I think, insofar as... So 
the the authority is not necessarily confined to um, a person or a few people, a politician, a right wing talk show host, or whatever. It's often sedimented mm. in a society, and it's there just waiting to be ignited, mm. right? So that has, I think, that's the sort of territory that Tony is on there. Mm. The story is a little bit complicated. I go into it quite a bit, a little bit in this book and quite a bit in my next book. Mm. So yes and no. I do think that the role of disgust is grotesquely overplayed mm. in, in this literature, however. I think horror is, is much more uh, appropriate when considering a lot of these things. Gotcha. Well, um, we uh, promised to end on time and it is two o'clock okay. uh, and I know we have students who have to get to their yes. next class. Uh, thank you again, David, for a fantastic talk. I, I wish that we, and, and people are saying thank you, David, on the, on the chat. Uh -huh. I wish we had a proper uh, live audience so you could hear what I know would yeah. be thunderous applause. Uh, but thank you. And thank you for everything you've taught us today. And I also thank all of you who joined us and for being here. And we'll also encourage you to visit our website and look at the other events we have. We have a whole series of events this year focused on this general topic of uh, ethics and justice. Before so, you sign off, uh, Shannon, before you sign off, uh, if people would like a signed copy of my book, they can uh, send a copy with the stamp self-addressed envelope to my workplace at the University of New England, Department of History and Philosophy. And I would be happy to do that and return it, or perhaps uh, visit a uh, case affiliated bookstore. Yes, we, w we will try to make that available to them as well. Uh, but that's very generous of you to agree to sign them. And I suspect some people will very much want to take you up on that. Well, so, feel free to contact me as well if they're further. Wonderful. Than you. And you can reach out to us at the Inamori Center if you need any help contacting our speaker. Thank you again, David. Thank you. And thank you all.